Hello, we will be using Noon Setting Daily Prayer, page 296 in the Lutheran Service Book. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Listen to my prayer, O God, do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. You will never let the righteous fall. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The psalm we'll have for today will be Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Text for meditation is John chapter 7, uh, verses 25 to 36. Then some of the people of Jerusalem said, Is this not the man they are going about to kill? Look, he speaks boldly, but they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? But we know this man, where he is from, and when Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. When Jesus cried out in the temple as he taught, saying, You know me and where I am from, you know. And yet I am not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. I know him, for I am of him, and he has sent me. Then they would have apprehended him, but no man laid hands on him, because his time was not yet come. Many of the people believed on him and said, when Christ comes, will he do more miracles than this man has done? The Pharisees heard that the people rumored such things about him. So when the Pharisees and high priests sent officers forth to seize him, then Jesus said to them, Yet a little while I am with you, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me, and will not find me, and where I am, there you cannot come. Then the Jews said between themselves, where will he go, that we will not find him? Will he go among the Gentiles, who are scattered all abroad, and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this, that he said, you, shall, you will seek me, and you will not find me, and where I am, there you cannot come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. So, clear as mud, right? Yeah. Uh, This immediately follows Jesus going up and speaking at the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, or uh, if you want to be a, kind of a literalist, the Feast of Tents. Jesus did not go there publicly because, well, the Jews were out to kill him ever since he healed the man at the pool of Bethsaida. So Jesus went in secret, but he still had to make himself known at the temple because, well, uh, if people could start accusing him of disobeying the law of Moses because all Jewish males had to go to this. So if uh, somebody could accuse him of that and make a plausible case, well, then Jesus' credibility would, would be shot. So Jesus made himself publicly known and began teaching in the temple and teaching quite rightly. People questioned, well, how can this country bumpkin, well, not quite, but uh, how can this bumpkin be teaching the scriptures when he has not been formally trained by a rabbi? And Jesus said, well, I'm from God, I'm from the Father, so of course I know what on earth he taught, according to his word. And 
if somebody is teaching according to God's word, then we should be teaching the same thing. So uh, if Jesus is conforming to how the rabbis would teach, then that proves that not only is uh, Jesus valid, but the rabbis are valid because they're teaching from the word of God, uh, holding to the word of God. But Jesus says, okay, well, if you accept my teaching, then why are you going about trying to kill me? And the people take great offense to this, <clears throat> saying, well, what do you mean we're trying to kill you? Well, Jesus, and then Jesus continues, well, uh, talking about uh, Moses and circumcision, basically he's saying, well, if it is lawful to do this act of the law, the circumcision, on a Sabbath, then why was it not right for me to heal on the Sabbath? Uh, which is why the people are trying to kill him. So, uh, our reading for today, beginning at verse 25, this is kind of in, in response to Jesus making these claims, and the people are now uh, kind of trying to identify who on earth this guy truly is. So they're trying to figure out exactly who he is and, and what he's doing there. So in verse 25, uh, some of the people of Jerusalem said, so this is not necessarily the first group who spoke up in objection to Jesus, uh, saying that he has a devil for accusing them of trying to kill him. And this is something that John does in scripture, is that he uses the same word to refer to different groups of people. This will also come up in uh, chapter 12 during the triumphal entry, where there are actually two crowds, but John just calls them the crowd. It gets a little bit confusing, but... <clears throat> so the people who are now kind of making the remarks, are like, is this not the man they, so referring to the first group of people, is this not the man they are going about to kill? So, they're like, oh, we are trying to kill you, yeah! Well, not necessarily the people who are speaking, but uh, in general, the, uh, the people who are adhering to the laws of the Pharisees saying that you cannot do, basically, basically you can't do good on the Sabbath, so you have to limit the amount of work that you do. But, as Jesus points out, well, if it is lawful and good, then you can do it on the Sabbath day. Uh, the Sabbath day is not about uh, trying to limit the goodness within the world, but honestly live in the Word of God and reflect upon the Word of God, which might indeed be acting in good towards your neighbor. So, um, the people were saying, is this not the man that some of the more... Uh, extreme Jews are trying to kill. Look, he speaks boldly, and Jesus certainly did, because he went up and said, oh, these people are going to kill me. Um, but they say nothing to him. So they don't really object so much to what Jesus is saying, or they don't really, uh, they can't really find grounds to really condemn him. They can't disagree with what he's actually speaking according to scripture, and people were marveling at how well Jesus was expounding upon scripture before, basically saying what God wills for his people. So now, understanding uh, how well he speaks of the word of God, because Jesus Christ himself is the word of God made flesh, uh, the people can't really object to anything Jesus says. Uh, they can try and kill him, but they don't really have any grounds to do so. Um, so, the people commenting on this continue. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? So the, the people speaking like, yeah, yeah, we think that he is, he is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the one prophesied in Old Testament scripture that he, he will come to save us. Uh, Christ being uh, the anointed one, quite literally, uh, translation of Messiah uh, from the Hebrew. So do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? But we know this man, where he is from, and where, when Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. Um, so the people are actually questioning, well, is this Christ? So they, when they say, do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Well, they're kind of going, well, does everybody think that he's the Messiah that God has sent for everybody? Because we know who he is, but we don't think that he's anything special. So we know this man, where he's from, and when Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. So they're making the point that uh, we know exactly who this Jesus of Nazareth is. He, he's the son of Joseph, he is a carpenter for quite some years, and now he's going about teaching as a rabbi. So we know where he's from, but if 
God sends us a Messiah, there will be some sort of divine origin of this guy, so no one will know exactly where he's from. But uh, Jesus is going to basically disagree with this in, in a subtle way. So Jesus cried out in the temple as he taught. So Jesus is still teaching. But he's crying out saying, you know me. And of course he does. Everybody knows that because Jesus has been quite public in his ministry. So, uh, you know me and where I am from. Like he didn't keep this a secret. And yet, I am not come of myself. So Jesus is saying that, well, don't pay attention to this. I have not come from my own understanding, which is the point that he made like just moments before in, or, uh, um, in uh, verse 18, yeah. He who speaks of himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him, so the Father, such a person is true and no unru unrighteousness is in him. So you do not go about trying to preach yourself or your own glory, but you only go about by the will of the Father. So Jesus is saying, uh, and yet I am when he says, I, yet I am not come of myself, so he's not coming as a man among them, saying, hey, look at me, aren't I the greatest man on earth? No, he's saying, I have come of the Father, look to the greatness of the Father, and then you will know who I am. So, uh, I am not come of myself, but he who, he, Father, who sent me is true, whom you do not know. So Jesus is saying, uh, um, you should know where I come from, mainly I come from the Father, I come from God, and Jesus Christ is himself God, as John 1.1 1, 1 says, that he is the word who was with God and who is God. So uh, the people should know where he's from, but Jesus is making an added point here, you don't actually know the Father, which is also a point in John chapter 1. Um, with, God, get the exact phrase. Verse here. So John 1, verse 18, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, and he has declared him. So only the Son of God, uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is God in the flesh, only he has seen the Father, and only he properly knows the Father. So when everybody is going about trying to destroy Jesus Christ, they are doing so out of ignorance of who God truly is, who, who the Father truly is, and they're only doing so because they are ignorant of him. So when you find a whole bunch of people trying to disparage Jesus, not only in the time of Jesus, but even today, when people are going about saying, well, I don't believe in Jesus Christ for X, Y, Z reason, well, then they are speaking not of who God truly is, nor are they speaking of the definition of truth. Jesus is the definition of truth, and him is life and truth, because he is the word who has made all things. Um, they are merely speaking of themselves, and they're trying to basically speak of their own glory, because they're saying, if I disbelieve in Jesus Christ, I'm holding uh, Jesus up to some sort of standard that is not the ultimate truth, ultimate word, ultimate life, because Jesus Christ is the word of God, made flesh, in whom is life and, and light and, and truth. So they're looking at some sort of standard and they're glorifying something else besides Jesus Christ, whether that be their own reason or some sort of historical data or some sort of linguistic theory, etc., etc., etc. I've heard quite a few different things from people trying to uh, destroy Christianity. But um, all that is from a very human point of view and it is against God the Father. So people trying to destroy Christ the Son in reputation back at the time of Jesus Christ or even now presently within our midst, they are doing so because they do not actually come of God. And that's the point Jesus is making. Um, <clears throat> so in verse 29, Jesus continues, I know the Father, for I am of him, and he has sent me. So, in a way, he's actually confirming the words of the Jews when they're speaking about him. So they're saying, but we know this man where he is from, and when Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. And Jesus is saying, yeah, you actually don't know where who the Messiah is from, because otherwise you'd know that I would be from the Father. So you are completely ignorant of these things, and you don't know the Christ. So this is why, John continues in verse 30, then they would have apprehended him, because Jesus has just called them out on their, not only their hypocrisy, but on their, 
basically irreligious steps because they're speaking against God the Father himself. So, But no man laid hands on Jesus because Jesus' time was not yet come. So Jesus was not about to go to the cross just yet, so he just went around them. <laughs> How? I don't know. But uh, Jesus just escaped them, so he was able to continue his ministry. Uh, continues in verse 31. Many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ comes, will he do more miracles than this man has done? So Jesus Christ has actually proved himself within his mir by way of his miracles already. Um, the miracles being signs that Jesus shows so that you may actually listen to his words and his words delivering you the truth. So even though many disbelieved based on what they uh, are, had already decided, so they were, they're already in their unbelief and they're in, uh, acting against God the Father. So uh, the people who believed, well, they believed because Jesus Christ had already shown them signs that he was the Messiah. Uh, the Pharisees heard that the people rumored such things about Jesus. So then the Pharisees and the high priest sent officers forth to seize him. So scared because of, or maybe not scared, scared might not be the right word because they don't know who quite who he is yet. They do become scared in um, after the raising of Lazarus in chapter 11. But right now they, they kind of hear these things and they want to get rid of this guy because they believe that he's speaking against their religion. So uh, the Pharisees heard these rumors, sent officers to try and seize him, bring him to trial, possibly even execute him because... That was the original thing with the pool of Bethsaida that uh, Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, so the Pharisees wanted to get rid of him. But, the, but then Jesus said to the Pharisees, or sorry, the officers sent forth to seize him. He says to them, Yet a little while I am with you, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me, and where I am, there you cannot come. Then the Jews said between themselves, Where will he go that we will not find him? Will he go among the Gentiles who are scattered all abroad and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this, that he said, You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am there you cannot come. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, this doesn't really, they don't really get an answer. <laughs> At least not at this point in time, the rest of the chapter uh, takes a different turn. So, uh, the Jews are obviously confused about this. What, what does he mean that we won't be able to find him? Is he going to go into the Gentile territory? So, they're see seeing this as a very worldly thing to try and interpret. So, uh, the Jews don't mix with Gentiles, as was mentioned back in chapter 4 with Jesus in Samaria. So, when... Uh, People go among the Gentiles, usually the Jews will not venture into those lands. Ancient Israel was very much divided between Israelite and, or sorry, Jewish. At that time it would be Jewish, the correct term Jewish, not necessarily Israelite. But Jewish territory and the Gentile territory. And in the Gentile territory, since that was unclean, Jews would not venture. So they're seeing this as, well, if he's going along among the Gentiles, then we won't see him anymore. But why is he going to teach among the Gentiles? He's speaking a very Jewish message because he's appealing to our God and according to our covenant because Jesus has been talking about Moses this entire time. So why would he go among the Gentiles? That doesn't make sense to us. And they don't understand because this is very worldly thinking and they're also thinking this in terms of um, essentially their unbelief. So they do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Christ, and he is not of the Father. So being ignorant of the Father, and because they're ignorant of the Father, also the Son, they are continuing in their unbelief and not understanding what Jesus is saying. But Jesus says, uh, had said, Yet a little while I am with you, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am, there you cannot come. So he is saying that I will go to the Father. And there is uh, two different instances where this happens. And either time, people will try to seek Jesus, but they will not find him, and they will not be able to join him. The first instance is when uh, Jesus is on the cross, and he goes uh, into death. His spirit returns 
to the Father, because that's that's what happens when people die, though, uh, or the faithful die, they go to the Father. So Jesus says, well, in death you will not be able to find me, there I am. Uh, you will try to find me here within this world, but you will not be able to find me. Uh, of course, Jesus' body remains here in this world, but Jesus Christ as the one who lives, his body is dead, but he is alive because he is the Christ, in him is life. So even though you die, yet he lives. Um, when Jesus died upon the cross, yes, his, his body was here, but like all the saints who die in the flesh, he goes to the Father. So he goes to the one who sent him. Um, the second instance of this actually happening is in the Ascension. Uh, John does not give, like the Gospel of John does not give a depiction of this, but the book of Revelation does, uh, where Jesus ascends into heaven, and there he is in the midst of the heavenly host, and he begins basically doomsday as he opens the seals of the scroll, and uh, the end of the world starts uh, coming about. So, uh, can we see Jesus Christ here? We'll, we can try and seek him. We will not find him, not, at least not in, in the form that we would uh, try to expect to. Um, say, uh, uh, as uh, the risen Christ. Because um, when he appears to John at the very beginning of the book of Revelation, uh, he appears as, well, basically God in the flesh. Uh, shining bright, uh, perfectly white clothes, uh, crowns, flames, um, sword coming out of his mouth, that is the word of God. So, uh, do we expect to see this every single day of our lives? No, we, typically we don't expect Jesus to appear to us like that, so we can try and seek all we want for Jesus Christ, uh, uh, perfectly revealing his, his divinity within his flesh, but we don't necessarily find him. Um, at least not in, at, at this point in time. So Jesus is saying to these people, of the wall, you cannot come to me at, like this. But Jesus is saying also, or at least hinting at, that he is of the Father, so it does not matter if we do not find him here, because if we hold to his teachings, that which he has given us, that have come from the Father, then we persist in faith unto life everlasting, and will eventually see Jesus Christ again in the flesh, as he promises us, uh, or as um, God, uh, the, writer, the Gospel writer John points us to in the book of Revelation, we will see him uh, in the world to come. We will see Jesus Christ in heaven, uh, and then also at the resurrection. We too will rise from our graves and uh, be with him for life everlasting. Yes, a little while he was here on earth, only a mere 30-something years, but he does promise an eternity afterwards in which we will have him with us always. Amen. We continue with the Curie on page 296. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, in your day there were many people who disparaged you and tried to fight against you, trying to kill you before your time. Today we find many people trying to disparage you, but in different ways. We ask, O Lord, your strength. Uh, we ask, O Lord, for the Holy Spirit to enlighten us so that when other people try to discredit you in the eyes of the world, we respond in faith and respond in your teachings that people everywhere may know the truth, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that you bring salvation to the entire world. Give us the strength to proclaim your world in all places so that some may believe, although uh, many try to 
continue in unbelief. Enlighten us and strengthen us and comfort us when we find ourselves in all manner of situations here in this world. In your name we pray, O Lord. Amen. Blessed Lord Jesus Christ, at this hour you hunt upon the cross, stretching out your loving arms to embrace the world in your death. Grant that all people of the earth may look to you and see their salvation. For your mercy's sake we pray. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.